the first of our lectures in molecular pharmacology will uh, be on DNA replication. So what you need to know for this particular lecture is to be able to describe DNA, uh, describe its components and its structure, describe the process of DNA replication in detail and the enzymes involved, and finally, how DNA can be a pharmacological target. To begin with, it's important to maybe introduce a few basic concepts about DNA. What's it made up of? What does it consist of? How does it look? These types of questions. Um, first of all, what is it actually made up of? Well, it has a number of nitrogen-containing bases, and these bases are shown on the right-hand side in the diagram. Um, four bases in particular are present in DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and these are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And these stand for A, G, C, and T, uh, in short hand notation. These um, nitrogen-containing bases, as I said, are shown in the diagram on the right, and you can see that the purines, which adenine and guanine are known as, consist of two ring structures, and you'll notice that there is a nitrogen um, present in a number of these in different locations on the, on the uh, structure. And the per pyrimidines then are the other molecules, the other nitrogen-containing bases, and these are contain a single ring structure, um, cytosine and thymine for DNA, and uracil then, which re replaces um, thymine in RNA, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. In addition to the nitrogen-containing bases, it also contains a sugar. In the case of DNA, it's called 2-deoxyribose. Um, and you'll see in the diagram in the bottom right, there's a structure of 2-deoxyribose and ribose, and in each case you can see at the second carbon. So the both both diagrams here are annotated with 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime and 5 prime. Um, and this is very important notation because it, um, it, it has consequences when we come to talk about replication, transcription and uh, in, in later lectures. So if you take a look at the carbon at position number 2 or 2 prime, you can see that that is attached to either a H or an OH, depending on whether it's deoxyribose or ribose. In the case of DNA, it has a deoxyribose, meaning there's no O um, at, attached to the carbon at position number 2. Um, something else I want to draw your attention to as well is from these sugars you can see quite clearly they're labelled in red with 5' prime carbon and 3' prime carbon. This, as I mentioned already, is important when it comes to things like replication and transcription because the directionality of the DNA molecule is important in terms of how it's actually read by enzymes and how it's synthesised by enzymes. The last component of uh, DNA is the phosphate group, and this is the PO4 double minus that you can see on the bottom left. So each of these um, three different components combine together to form what's called a nucleotide. So this nucleotide con consists of a single nitrogenous base, and that could be A, C, G, or T, highlighted in green on the diagram on the left. This then is bonded to a sugar. In the case of DNA, it's deoxyribose. In the case of RNA, it's ribose. And the final part of it, that is, is the phosphate group. These single nucleotides then are paired together. And an A will um, bond with a T, an adenine will bond with a thymine, and a G will always bond with a cytosine. And if you remember that this, uh, this, this is called base pairing. So this is where the, the, uh, the single nucleotides always have a, a single binding partner. When this is done many, many millions of times, the, not only the, second, uh, the secondary structure, but also the three-dimensional structure of DNA is affected by this, um, and it forms what's known as a double helix. So the double helix is shown on the top right-hand side, and it shows that the bits in yellow essentially are, are your bases that b always bond together. And the uh, bits in blue, as indicated by the diagram, represent the sugar and phosphate backbone. Um, you can see quite clearly that they form what looks like a kind of a spiral st staircase. Um, this structure was worked out by um, the Nobel Prize winning scientists um, Watson and Crick, but also 
uh, Morris Wilkins and the structure which is uh, has been worked out by uh, uh, X-ray diffraction, the picture shown in the bottom right was worked out by a scientist called Rosalind Franklin, but she did not share the Nobel Prize because she had uh, she had died before the prize was actually given. But she did the 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 uh, the discovery part of this. So, with DNA, um, it is important to state that it's not uh, naked in the cell; it doesn't exist by itself. It tends to have quite a number of different proteins attached to it or involved in compacting it within our cell. If we were to stretch out all our DNA like as a, as a single double-stranded molecule, it would go on for miles and miles, but obviously we have all of our DNA compacted inside in, uh, in each uh, cell nucleus. So in order to do this, it needs extensive folding and it needs to form very, very distinct structures. So the basic unit of a chromosome is known as a nucleosome and a nucleosome consists of DNA, so the, the DNA double helix and what are known as histone proteins and the histone proteins of which there are eight in each single unit uh, wrap around each other very very tightly. So the diagram on the right gives a better indication of what this actually looks like. So at the very top you have a, a DNA double helix and it's it's uh, been stretched out as if it was uh, on, on a single line. Um, the next step up, if you kind of imagine that you're zooming out of the DNA, you can see that it's wrapped tightly around um, a histone, a, a group of histone proteins or, or a nucleosome as we've, we've said. Each one of these nucleosomes, and you can see this in the diagram in the bottom left, has DNA, roughly of about 146 uh, base pairs of DNA, wrapped around eight histone proteins very, very tightly. And there's also then linker DNA, which is the gap between each individual nucleosome unit, uh, also indicated in the diagram. Each of these nucleosomes are, again, folded on top of each other. And if you go back to the diagram on the right, the third picture down, you can see that these almost look like a string of beads packed very, very tightly um, into each other. Uh, this, again, if you zoom out, is folded and zooming out again, folded and folded very, very tightly to give what we see when we look under the, the, the microscope, which is the chromosome, the, the familiar structure of the chromosome, um, with its uh, centromere in the middle and that um, that kind of um, unique uh, looking uh, structure that, that we'd be familiar with. We have, of course, um, 23 pairs of chromosomes um, and these are indicated in the diagram on the bottom right. These are not all the same size. Um, many are, are quite big and some are quite small. Um, and of course then the ones that identify us as being male or female um, are the X and Y chromosomes, which are again shown on the bottom right. The central dogma um, that was originally defined in molecular bio biology stated that uh, DNA in the cell was used to make RNA, and RNA then was used to make protein. Um, this tends to be true in the majority of cases. However, in recent years, there's been a number of discoveries which have kind of bucked the trend and go against this. A notable example would be the use of um, retroviruses, which are RNA-based virus particles. Um, and these have to reverse transcribe to form DNA, first of all, then to make RNA and then to make protein in the cell if they're to complete their life cycle. Um, in addition to that, there's also been the discovery of what are known as non-coding RNA molecules, which have uh, a different purpose. Um, so for most cases, um, the, the DNA that we have in our cell will um, be used for something, and we'll discuss some of that later. In the cases where it's coding for a gene, the gene will be read, will be uh, transcribed, turned into RNA, and this RNA then will be translated into protein. The, the transcription process will be the basis of our second lecture, but just very, very briefly, you can see that the DNA strand, um, although it is double-stranded, only one of these strands is actually read during transcription, and this is the, the DNA template, as it's called, and this is used to form messenger RNA. This messenger RNA then is translated into protein using a very, very, very distinct uh, codon 
reading um, uh, process, which we'll talk about in lecture three. So in order for cells to actually make RNA or to make protein, there needs to be enough of it there. And every time our cells divide, we make new copies of DNA. And the process that's used is, caused, is called DNA replication. And the purpose of this is to copy all the genetic material in the cell before a cell divides. So each dividing daughter cell inherits a new DNA helix, one old and one new uh, strand. And this is known as uh, semi-conservative replication. So it isn't just a, a process by which you transfer it to another cell of some kind. It is actually allows you to form two new cells and one cell gets one half of the, the strand and the other half gets the other half of the strand. And in the process of DNA replication, there is some amount of synthesis of new strands. So this takes place by an enzyme called uh, DNA polymerase. And it happens in a five prime to three prime direction. Um, and this is kind of what I referred to earlier. So if we just flip back very, very briefly, you can see that on the double strand you, uh, in the middle, you can see that at the top left there's something called 5 prime, and on the top right there's something called 3 prime. And on the bottom left there's 3 prime, and the bottom right there's 5 prime. The DNA replication process takes place in a 5 prime to 3 prime direction, and this is referring to the individual carbons indicated on the sugars, so the deoxyribose in the case of uh, DNA. So the direction in which it occurs is from the 5 prime carbon down to the 3 prime carbon. Because both strands do not um, travel downwards always, they are what we call anti-parallel. So you can take a look at this very, very briefly in the diagram in the middle. You notice in the diagram on the left, it, it, uh, it travelling downwards, it goes 5 prime, 3 prime. But on the diagram on the right, it goes 3 prime to 5 prime. So this is important to be aware of because it, they both don't go from 5 prime to 3 prime travelling downwards. But regardless of which direction the template strand is, the DNA polymerase will always um, synthesize the new DNA in a 5 prime to 3 prime direction. And this involves the sequential addition of nucleotides in this direction. In order for this to happen though, we need to unpack the DNA because as we've seen already, DNA is very, very tightly packed in um, it's wound up, it's packed with histone proteins, these are folded heavily upon each other and in order for DNA to be replicated in time for cell division <coughs> it needs to be unwound and unzipped and to do this it needs the help of some other enzymes um, most notably DNA topoisomerase and DNA helicase. In addition to that it also needs some um, help from other proteins. So if you unzip DNA because it's so tightly wound up like anything that you unzip or un unwind, it's going to have some tension associated with it. So if you unzip it very, very quickly, it can, um, it, it can uh, unravel and uh, travel in many, many different directions. But we want the DNA double strand to stay quite close um, to the enzymes. And in order to do this, it needs what are called single strand DNA binding proteins to stabilize the DNA once it's open. The part at which the DNA begins to open is known as a replication fork and we have what are called leading strands and lagging strands. So one of the strands of the double-stranded molecule will be called the leading strand and the other strand of the double-stranded molecule will be called a lagging strand. As mentioned already, both strands will be copied in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction but this obviously means then that for one of the strands it's going to mean incomplete fragments on a lagging strand and these are known as Okazaki fragments and I'll just show you using a diagram here what I actually mean by this. So if you have the parental DNA being unzipped and you can see that it's it's traveling from uh, it's being unzipped from from right to left um, the one of the strands the leading strand is able to be synthesized no problem as the DNA is being unzipped it can just add new nucleotides in a 5 prime to 3 prime direction without uh, causing any fuss. However if you take a look at the bottom one of these strands, the lagging strand, it can't do that. Why not? Well, because it's synthesizing it from left to right in this case, and as the DNA is un unzipping, there's going to be more DNA left behind as it unzips further. So then the DNA polymerase enzyme has to go back to the left, synthesize from left to right. The DNA unzips further, then has to go back to the left, synthesize to the right. And what you end up with 
rather than a continuous strand like you do on the top, you end up with a series of small fragments. And these have been named Okazaki fragments after the person who discovered them. So while there is no major issue with the leading strand, it's a continuous piece of, of, of DNA that can be double bonded. The Okazaki fragments do cause a bit of a problem because there are going to be gaps between these and these need to be combined together very carefully. So in the case of the lagging strand synthesis, the DNA polymerase must start at a new site on the template each time it completes a fragment uh, because the DNA is unzipping behind it. And to do this, it needs a new primer each time. It needs something that can recognize the DNA template. And to do this, it has what's called an RNA primer. And the RNA primer is made by an enzyme called DNA primase. And these are normally 10 nucleotides long, and they occur at intervals of about 100 to 200 base pairs. And as the DNA unzi uh, unzips uh, behind it, the DNA polymerase extends the RNA primer with DNA. However, if you take a look at the diagram on the right, you obviously have a lot of DNA, but you also have pieces that are made of RNA, and these need to be removed. So once the DNA polymerase has finished a DNA fragment, the old RNA primer needs to be erased and replaced by DNA. It also needs to seal any nicks or any gaps that there might be. This is done by an enzyme known as DNA ligase. So the DNA ligase joins the new Okazaki fragments to the growing chain. This is just showing you what it might look like um, in a kind of a, a 3D picture with all of the different enzymes. So it has the leading strand, it has the lagging strand, the DNA has been unwound and unzipped by DNA helicase and uh, you can see that that's traveling in this case from, from, from left to right, it's being unzipped. Uh, the DNA polymerase is very easily able to synthesize the newly, uh, new, new um, strand on the leading strand. But when it comes to the lagging strand, it needs the RNA primer it needs the DNA polymerase, uh, in this case, um, to go from right to left. Uh, each time it needs a new primer. It needs the single-strand binding proteins to hold the DNA in, in place so it's not flying all over the place. And then at the end it needs the DNA ligases to fill in the gaps. So, um, what is important to state at this stage is, while we always say A's bond with T's and C's bond with G's every single time. That's not entirely true. There are mistakes made. If you think of the number of times our DNA is, is replicated and our cells replicate every day, um, there is some potential for error making. And fidelity is usually uh, estimated at, at one mistake in every 10 to the 9 nucleotides copied. So that's one in every billion nucleotides there's a mistake, which is a pretty good rate. Um, so in some cases you can have G's bonding to T's, uh, C's bonding to A's, for example. So there's a, an incorrect nucleotide inserted. And while this might, might not seem like a big deal, this is our store of genetic information, and any mistakes made will have a permanent effect on how DNA is transcribed and how it's translated and turned into protein, which may, in some cases, lead to misfolded proteins or proteins that are incorrect with incorrect activities. So it is extremely important to have a proofreading activity uh, in, included in this replication process. So the first proofreading uh, by DNA polymerase occurs just before a new nucleotide is added to the chain. Um, so in order for the, the DNA polymerase to add a new nucleotide, the enzyme must first undergo a conformational change, meaning its three-dimensional structure, its active site, must change ever so slightly. And what happens is, is that it can only add the right nucleotide to this particular uh, position. So if it's incorrect, it's unlikely to bind properly and it can dissociate. But as we said, this sometimes does happen in normally one in a billion cases is that the incorrect one does stay bound and it, it, it needs then to also be proofread a second time as a result. So the second proofreading is also by DNA, DNA polymerase and this is called an exonucleolytic proofreading activity. Um, and this occurs in a 3' prime to 5' prime, uh, uh, direction. So if you remember, the DNA polymerase synthesizes in a 5' prime to 3' prime um, uh, direction, but once it's past the nucleotide that it's just added, it can then go back in the other direction, reread to make sure that it has uh, added the right base, and then cleave off or clip off any unpaired residues that, that are, are not bound correctly or that have weak binding capacity. And this is the second uh, proofreading activity. So it removes the incorrect base.
Uh, other enzymes to mention at this stage include the DNA topoisomerases. Um, as mentioned already, when you separate the strands of DNA, it, there is going to be enormous tension, and because it's coiled so much, uh, this supercoiling will generate stress and sometimes breaks in the DNA, which obviously is bad news if you uh, are talking about replicating DNA um, for all of the, the chromosomes in, in, your, in your cell. Um, so in order to relieve some of this stress and, and tension, the, the topoisomerase cut DNA, a uh, segment of DNA passes through the break and then reseals, and the to topoisomerase cuts one of the strands of DNA. This relaxes the tension, it relaxes the supercoil, and then uh, a topoisomerase 2 cuts both strands. So this is in, in, in other cases where there might be even stronger tension. And this can be a relief during the process of DNA replication. It is then fixed after the process is over and it's uh, wound up again uh, in order to form the, the double helix. So DNA is obviously present in a in, in, uh, large number of, of organisms, but it does differ between different um, uh, kingdoms of organisms, in particular prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So in prokaryotes, um, the, DNA pro the DNA replication process begins at a, a place called an ORI, or an origin of replication. Um, and this is a sequence in a genome at which the DNA replication is initiated. So bacteria have a single cir circular molecule of DNA. It's not like our chromosomes. It's a single uh, circular piece of DNA, double-stranded. And typically we'll only have a single origin of replication per circular chromosome. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, because of the size of their uh, chromosomes, often have multiple origins of replication on each linear chromosome that can initiate at different times with up to 100,000 present, in some cases, in a single cell. Um, many origins of replication help to speed the duplication process. Uh, so if you were to start, for example, on a large chromosome in a human cell, at the very, very top, it could take a long time before you have all the DNA replicated. So it's much more uh, efficient if you have several different origins of replication and join all the different parts up at the very, very end. The segment of DNA that is copied starting from each unique uh, replication origin is called a replicon. So what does this actually look like? So the origin of replication, if you can imagine a piece of DNA, um, occurs in what's known as an origin of replication, and this forms what's called a replication bubble. So you can have the DNA being replicated in two different directions. In each case, obviously, it's 5' prime to 3' prime because they're, they're, they are anti-parallel strands. The red um, strand indicates the parental DNA, and the blue or, or purple um, strand indicates the daughter or new newly synthesized strand and one is going in uh, to the right and one's going to the left but as I mentioned each time it's 5 prime to 3 prime. This is just showing you what it lo might look like under the microscope of a human chromosome or an animal chromosome where you have uh, multiple origins and replications and therefore multiple replication bubbles that are occurring. These are indicated by the, the red arrows. So chromosomes are much larger than pro uh, human chromosomes are much larger than prokaryotes. They start at several sites. Um, the DNA is linear rather than circular. Um, so when the last primer from the very end chromosome is removed, it can't be replaced. Um, this can be a problem and eventually over time lead to a shortening of chromosomes. So this is um, something that is uh, not present in bacterial or prokaryotic chromosomes. So where does it stop then? Where does replication stop? Well the leading strand copies the parental strand to the very very end. At a replication fork the lagging strand is synthesized using multiple RNA primers and the lagging strand will be shortened by the length of the RNA primer unless it is protected. So this is what we were mentioning already at the end of some chromosomes. Um, when the RNA primer is eventually removed um, there is nothing to join it to and it simply shortens the chromosome um, every time it replicates. So we need to have protective structures in place and the ends of human chromosomes at least are protected by structures known as telomeres and these contain hundreds of tandem repeats um, of a hexanucleotide meaning six different nucleotide sequences. One strand is G-rich at the three prime end, uh, for example A-G-G-G-T-T -T in humans and these are shown in the diagram at the bottom right. 
and this is able to protect the end of the chromosomes from shortening by too much um, and it's replicated as well by a separate enzyme known as telomerase this is an enzyme that elongates the lagging strand in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction so in the opposite direction to replication in order to protect against this uh, telomerase is associated with an ornate pr uh, template for the synthesis of DNA um, and t t uh, telomere length typically increase during development and it has been associated with aging as well so what has all this got to do with pharmacology well believe it or not DNA is an actual drug target and new therapies are being developed all the time using DNA technology particularly things like gene therapy uh, antisense RNAs, small interfering RNAs in addition to that, DNA replication is a drug target for many different processes and we'll be talking about this in particular when we come to antibacterial lectures um, in, in a few weeks time and also um, with the, the treatment of cancers so chemotherapy is often uh, uh, made up of drugs that target DNA replication in rapidly dividing cells it's also used to inhibit uh, viral infection, antiviral drugs and just uh, examples of targets include DNA polymerase and DNA topoisomerase. So one example of a drug that can inhibit DNA polymerase is known as acyclovir. So this might be better known by the trade names of Virex that's used for uh, cold sores, for example, caused by uh, herpes simplex virus. And this targets the DNA polymerase of viruses. There's many other drugs that do this as well, and um, but acyclovir is just the example that uh, I'm going to give today. Um, so acyclovir works because it is very similar to G's, gu uh, guanines. Um, you'll notice there in the diagram on the right, you can see guanosine, which is the nucleotide G, um, on the top, and it's highlighted in purple. And acyclovir then is below it, and it's highlighted in pink. So you can see there that the uh, structures are very very similar and they only are slightly different from each other for this it means that it can act as a decoy or as a, a dummy molecule for the enzyme DNA polymerase in the viral cells it will bind with the acyclovir and the acyclovir acts as an enzyme inhibitor so host cell kinases convert the monophosphate version to the triphosphate active form and it inhibits the DNA polymerase causing it to terminate the nucleotide chain now what this means for the virus is that viruses are very much depending dependent on replicating their DNA once they get inside a cell and they need to do this very very quickly in order to make more particles of itself however if you have an, uh, a drug like acyclovir able to inhibit the DNA polymerase enzyme it is not able to replicate within the cell and what's useful for humans then is that it does not interfere as much with the human DNA polymerase so it's 30 times more potent at viral DNA polymerase then the host cell or the human uh, cell enzyme, which is obviously important because then it would inhibit cells from uh, actual uh, cell division. A second uh, drug target would be the DNA topoisomers, which we discussed earlier. Um, two drugs that are able to inhibit uh, DNA topoisomers include ciprofloxacin, which is an antibiotic and it targets bacterial topoisomers, and the drug etoposide, which is used in cancer chemotherapy, and this inhibits human DNA topoisomerase. So in summary, um, just remember that DNA consists of nucleotides, uh, nucleotide triphosphates in a double helix and their structure um, is wound tightly around histone proteins. We then discussed uh, DNA replication and the purpose of DNA replication is to copy all the genetic material before cell division. And finally, then we discussed at the end that DNA enzymes can act as drug targets and have uh, antibacterial and uh, cytotoxic effects in cancer chemotherapy.